Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. I'm John Eltridge, and with me today as well, Craig McConnell. We're so excited about this month of January, so excited about the podcast that we're featuring on holiness, on the utter relief of holiness. Last week, we introduced the fact that I have a new book out called The Utter Relief of Holiness, and talked about that, excerpted a little bit from chapter one. And what we're going to do is give you another taste today from chapter two, this time on the compelling goodness of Jesus. Yeah. You've read this chapter. Yeah, I loved it, John. Just uh, um, to people who were, as you say, anything but holy, you look at the life of Christ and it's absolutely attractive and desirous. You want to know and be with this guy the way he treated women, the way he handled power, the way he treated people. He just stands out as free, alive. And uh, and this holiness thing is actually uh, captivating. It's attractive. It's luring. It really is. And so, friends, without further ado, we want to give you another taste here, this time from Chapter 2 of The Utter Relief of Holiness. The Compelling goodness of Jesus. Then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name Zacchaeus, the head tax man and quite rich. He wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. He was a short man and couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus when he came by. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have getting cozy with this crook? Zacchaeus just stood there, a little stunned. He stammered apologetically, Master, I give away half my income to the poor, and... If I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. Jesus said, today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. I love this story. It is so unexpected and funny and so whimsical. Here's this short guy. Picture Danny DeVito who frankly is a bit of a traitor and a swindler. Though a Jew, he has sided with the Roman occupation forces, extracting Caesar's taxes from his own countrymen and skimming a little off the top for himself. Jesus is passing through town. The little man tries to get to the front of the row, but the crowd, they hate tax collectors, shove him back. So he runs ahead of the caravan and climbs a tree in his full-length Armani robe Why does Zacchaeus find Jesus so compelling? He wanted desperately to see Jesus. Fascinating. Apparently, he's either heard stories about this man from fellow bill collector Matthew, maybe, or he's seen him from a distance before, and now he simply must get a closer look. Now, the next moment is as rich as the Gospels get. Jesus pauses under the tree and looks up. Oh, to have seen the expression on Jesus' face, the twinkle in his eye, the slight grin behind the serious command. He knows what this is going to do to the little pirate's world. Come on down, Zacchaeus. How did he know his name? I'm having lunch at your house. He just invites himself over? Oh, the beautifully disruptive ways of Jesus. Disruptive both for the crowd... What business does he have getting cozy with this crook? And for the little extortionist, too. Zacchaeus' reaction is so utterly extravagant, we never see it coming. I give away half my savings to the poor. What? Have you been around money people much? 
let me remind you that it is a fool and his money who are soon parted. The rich and clever are never separated from theirs. And when they do give way to a philanthropic urge, they are always certain to get a tax deduction. On the spot, Zacchaeus cuts his lifestyle, his portfolio, and his retirement in half? And then he goes on to promise a total change of life? Wow. There was, obviously, something about Jesus, some wonderful quality that compelled people to want to be good. And this is where we must begin our search for holiness, not with pressure, nor with shame or command. The only lasting change is the kind that seized Zacchaeus, and this comes by way of Jesus. So the best thing we can do is push our way to the front of the crowd or scale a tree and have a closer look ourselves. Now, for a far fuller encounter with Jesus, you'll want to read Beautiful Outlaw. There, I have an entire book to unveil what we only have a chapter for here. This is the glance from the sycamore. That is having Jesus over to spend a few weeks at your house. Here's something I think most people have never seen before. This moment takes place on Easter morning. Jesus of Nazareth has been systematically tortured and then hung by his hands and feet from timbers. He died, and his body quickly laid in a borrowed tomb. But early Sunday morning, the event that changed the history of mankind took place without a single witness. Jesus was raised from the dead. If it were you, whom would you want to show yourself to first? Part of me says, those religious bullies, the oppressors of my people, the ones who sent me to my death, that'll shock the hell out of them, which is, of course, exactly what needs shocking out of them. His closest friends come to mind. They're devastated. Wouldn't you rush to share the good news? And then I think, no, it would be best to show myself to the crowds still in the city. This is the moment of moments to get conversions rolling to start the revolution that will be called Christianity. And, of course, there is my mother. She is heartbroken. Whom does Jesus choose? He appears first and privately to Mary Magdalene. No one yet knew from the Scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, She knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking he was the gardener, said, Mister, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. And Jesus said, Mary. So much, so very much spoken in just one word, her name, Mary. This is an incredibly beautiful scene. There must have been something particularly sweet and deep in their relationship for Jesus to have chosen her as the first person he wanted to speak to after coming back to life. And it is this, Jesus' ability to have intimate relationships with single women that is really striking. His capacity to engage the opposite sex with absolute integrity and utter fearlessness is incredible. We've had presidents who couldn't be trusted on this front for two minutes. It has been the snare of many a pastor as well. And as a result, there is a good deal of fear and awkwardness between men and women who are not married to each other, especially in the church. But Jesus is showing that it needn't even be an issue? Wow. His entourage includes a number of women traveling with him. Very, very unusual in that day prostitutes throw themselves at his feet. And how about the story of his encounter with the single woman whom he meets by a well? I love that story. She is, shall we say, not exactly strict with her sexual boundaries. Jesus engages her in conversation, which is in itself a shocking move. No rabbi would 
ever have done this. She's suspicious, defensive, and then, well, she seems to think that Jesus has something else in mind. He senses the shift and says to her, go call your husband and come back. She replies that she has no husband, which is technically true, though she has had five and is currently living with a man. Why does she hide this information? This is a scandalous scene. And I love Jesus' integrity. He is neither seduced nor frightened. He continues to pursue her heart and eventually wins her to the kingdom of God. We are witnessing something here that goes beyond good behavior. This genuine holiness is flowing from deep within. Jesus is saturated with it. Power. And then there is the question of how a man handles power, fame, popularity, influence. As I mentioned, the Gospels begin not with Jesus, but with his cousin John the Baptist. It is John who gets the revival rolling. And then Jesus' ministry begins to take hold and quickly overtakes and surpasses John's, which is, of course, the very thing John wanted to happen. But it's an awkward moment. Watch how Jesus handles it in an overlooked passage from the fourth gospel. Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed, although his disciples, not Jesus, did the actual baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. And so Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. He just up and leaves, right when his movement is gaining momentum? This is classic Jesus. As soon as popularity surges in one town, Jesus leaves and heads someplace that is three or four days' journey away. On Palm Sunday, he enters Jerusalem to cheering throngs. That night, He ducks out of town and stays in a humble village with a few close friends. His humility is just remarkable. There is deference here, modesty that is so holy. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought him the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. From Mark 12. We see here that it is not false humility. Jesus doesn't cuddle up to flattery. Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity, blah, blah, blah. Most of us soften in the face of flattery, but not Jesus. Again, this is so rare among the rich and famous. Most leaders surround themselves with people who flatter them. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they went out and went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. From Luke 9. Now this is absolutely extraordinary. Jesus has no need to be the center of the action. He sends his friends out to do the very things he does. He gives them a major role in his campaign. You go do it. Do everything you see me doing. This is humble, and this is extraordinarily generous. Jesus is absolutely open-handed with his kingdom. There is no need for the whole thing to always be about him. He is absolutely delighted to share his kingdom with us. He later says, Don't be afraid, little ones. Your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. Most men get power and then crave more. As their stars rise, they can't bear to have others in the spotlight. They typically abuse the power they have, and in the end, it winds up crushing them and everyone around them. You recall the expression, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? 
It was a lesson learned through the long, soiled history of men and power. But then we have Jesus, who walks right through the snares as if they weren't even there, handling immense power with casual grace. People. But far and above, the most revealing aspect of anyone's character is how he handles people. Friends, I hope you understand this. The way a person handles others is the acid test of his true nature. How is Jesus with people? What's he like to be around? One day children were brought to Jesus in the hope that he would lay his hands on them and pray over them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus intervened, let the children alone. Don't prevent them from coming to me. God's kingdom is made up of people like these. After laying his hands on them, he left. A simple story, very Sunday school, but we've made a precious moment out of it and thus miss both the reality and the beauty. Our church held a meeting last week, and apparently child care wasn't available because the little ones were dashing up and down the halls and, once in a while, in and through the middle of the gathering. Now, most people tried to put a good face on it, but after several interruptions, you could feel the irritation. The mood shifted from, how cute, at the first interruption, to, that's enough of that, at the third, to, little nuisance, where are your parents, by romp number five. I indulged in the irritation myself. This is at the core of human nature, this thing in us that growls, do not mess with my program. Do not get in my way. If you aren't aware of how deep this runs in you, how do you feel when people cut in line at the market or the movies, cut you off on the highway, make it difficult for you to get your job done, or make it impossible for you to get some sleep? What angers us is almost always some version of you are making my life even harder than it already is. Get out of the way. Not Jesus. He welcomes intrusion. In Luke's version of the story, the disciples succeed in shooing off both the parents and the tykes, but Jesus called them back. Later, Jesus passes two blind men on the road. They create a ruckus in order to get his attention. His handlers try to shut them up, but Jesus stops what he's doing and gives them his undivided attention. Do you recall the wedding at Cana? where he turned water into wine? By Jesus' own words, it is clear that he had not intended to reveal himself at the time in that way. But his mom asked, and the groom was in a tight spot, and the party would have died far too soon, so he does it anyway, to the tune of 180 gallons of wine. He is such an immensely gracious person. I love him for that. I yearn to be like that. Meanwhile in Capernaum, there was a certain official from the king's court whose son was sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and asked that he come down and heal his son who was on the brink of death. Jesus put him off. Unless you people are dazzled by a miracle, you refuse to believe. But the court official wouldn't be put off. Come down. It's life or death for my son. Jesus simply replied, Go home. Your son lives. On his way back, his servants intercepted him and announced, Your son lives! He asked them what time he began to get better, and they said, The fever broke yesterday afternoon at one o'clock. And the father knew that it was at that very moment that Jesus had said, Your son lives. From John chapter 4. What we see here is his kindness in spite of the fact that people don't get him or the purpose of his coming. They aren't putting their lives in his hands. They're hoping for some help, and that's it. Jesus is clearly grieved by the fact that these people continue to ask for miracles, but have no intention of becoming his followers. And yet, he heals for them anyway. His immense goodness is what captures me. He is, after all, the one who said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He's probably the only one who's ever done it consistently. On and on the stories go. Denied and abandoned by Peter, Jesus doesn't even hold it against him. Tortured mercilessly, he says, Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. 
look, I think I can get around eventually to forgiving people so long as they ask me to, apologize, and seem genuinely sorry. But Jesus, he forgives his executors before there's even a hint of remorse. Wouldn't you love to live like that? What you are seeing in any one of these stories is holiness. I think if any one of us could have known Jesus personally in that day, we would have loved his company, his ability to navigate difficult situations, to deal with people who didn't know how to deal with him, his ability to engage the opposite sex, take on the religious leaders with the right spirit and attitude. It's just astounding. And one more thing, Jesus isn't gutting it through life. There's no sense of him gritting his teeth, biting his tongue, none of that internal anguish most of us require to pull this off for a day or two. He is walking through it all with such grace and strength. He is living life as it was meant to be lived. That's the utter relief of holiness. And oh, how utterly attractive it is. Genuine goodness is captivating. You can tell a lot about a person by his effect on others. What is he like to be around? What is the aftertaste he leaves in your mouth? Is this someone you'd want to take a long car ride with? We saw Zacchaeus' reaction. Here are two more from people quite different from each other and from Zacchaeus. One of the Pharisees asked him over for a meal. He went in to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table. Just then, a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping, raining tears on his feet, letting down her hair. She dried his feet, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfume. From Luke 7. Now, no comment of mine could add to the beauty of this moment nor to this one. Two others, both criminals, were taken along with him for execution. When they got to the place called Skull Hill, they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The people stood there staring at Jesus, and the ringleaders made faces, taunting. He saved others. Let's see him save himself. The Messiah of God. Ha! The chosen, ha! The soldiers also came up and poked fun at him, making a game of it. They toasted him with sour wines. Oh, you're king of the Jews. Save yourself. Printed over him was a sign, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him. Some Messiah you are. Save yourself, save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus said, don't worry, I will. Today, you will join me in paradise. What is stunning to see in these brief accounts is that people who knew themselves to be anything but holy found the holiness of Jesus winsome open-armed and utterly compelling. Is this how you've understood holiness? It changes everything when you do. Thanks for listening in to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. And again, The Utter Relief of Holiness is available now wherever books are sold and also on the Ransomed Heart website. In fact, we are offering a buy one, give one. We'll give you a second book if you order on our website for you to share with a friend. That's at RansomedHeart.com.